I wanted to do a video on rebuilding carburetors on trimmers and stuff. I think this would be awesome to do. But I think I've already done that. So when you do a carburetor, you have two objectives. One is to not have any leaks anywhere, like I had a vacuum leak. Uh, two is you can see that this is kind of worn out. You see how that's caved in there? And this one is fresh and good. So basically parts fail and then also holes get plugged off. That's why you use a carburetor cleaner with a straw. This is my favorite kind. It's super, super effective. Always wear eye protection when using it though. But you can use this little straw. It fits in the different holes. You can just blast them out. So you blast here and you'll have it squirt out different places. So if there's any debris that gets past the fuel filter. Um, but basically I just lay out the old parts and then put the new parts underneath. The reason why you pair them up is that your kit will come so that it will cover several different models. Like mine doesn't have anything like this in it. It doesn't have that. But all these extra gaskets that you just don't need, it's just confusing. So when you take it apart, you just take it apart in order. And then just all the pieces that come off, you lay them in a row. Um, you got two sides that you take off, this side and that side. This is the side that has your needle and all this stuff in it. That's real easy to remember and it's four screws, not two, so you don't confuse them. Um, on the other side you have one screw in the middle. You can see the screen is on this side. and You, you see how it's been in there all perfect? So if you have a small quarter inch dry socket set, that's perfect for setting that. Um, but usually you can just blast it out with your cleaner. Just put the straw in the different ports and just uh, blast them through. Put it on the end of the hose, blast that, blast this. And uh, before you know it, you've got stuff gone through pretty much everything. See this little metal part, this plate here? A lot of people don't bother with it and for good reason. Uh, but you get a new one, it comes like that. You hit it in the middle with the socket, it makes it expand out flat. And it locks it in place. Kind of locked in place just sitting there. Wow. You can see where it's been dinged and dented in there. That gets you in, inside there where you can clean that out too if you want. I try to do it, but I don't always do it. So to get that out, you just deform it. You take a flathead screwdriver and then just bash it on one side or the other and it makes it shape like a V, which makes the circumference smaller. You can use like a brass hammer or something like that on the screwdriver, of course. Anyway, those little holes are so that you have something to idle. And what about the choke? You always have to use a choke on these. You can see there's two screws that go through the carburetor. One here, one here. So the choke is just this little plate that basically asphyxiates or chokes the carburetor. And that causes it to have less airflow and more fuel. It makes it rich for starting. Pretty simple. This injects fuel. Uh, through the little holes in the sides of it. If I were to open this up and give you a look inside, the jet is back in that corner, right? Like the screw's pointing at it. It's right back up in there. These are in everything, including my paramotor. So if you look on this, this is the Vitarazzi 185 Moster. It's a really popular, awesome, awesome uh, setup. But what does it say? It says Walbro. Of course, I've got an external fuel filter so that it doesn't plug up that little screen on the inside that we were just showing you. And my diaphragm, I've got an apparatus where I can say, you know, I can hold it down and disable it so that if the engine's doing some runaway crazy thing, I can kill it. But anyway, they use them in everything. Uh, trimmers, chainsaws, aircraft, uh, model aircraft, just all kinds of long garden stuff. So here's the trimmer. The carburetor would mount on the back right here. Now with this one, the filter's actually inside of it. So if you follow this line, it goes to this bulb, and then from the bulb back up into the tank. And if you look inside the tank, you can see that little white thing right there. That's the fuel filter. So you've got the vent line that also goes to the tank from back here, from the bottom of the carburetor, like a return line. If you have a good filter, if you put clean gas in it, then typically you don't have a lot of the issues with junk getting in the screen there. Did I show you the screen over on this side? See, here's the replacement screen. But this screen, it's not damaged, it's not full of garbage. There can be garbage that gets stuck behind it possibly, but usually not. Anyway, now I'm all tempted to take them out since I filmed it and be that responsible guy that does all of it. But typically you don't need to do that. You can save them in the bag and if the first rebuild doesn't work like a charm and you're not completely satisfied, 
it's super easy to get right back in there and all your gaskets are new enough. So I think we're going to call it good at that. Should we just put it together? Let's put it together. So we've got one screw, two gaskets, and a plate. This is really basic because we're not doing the screen. The screen's clean and great. So you ask yourself, self, which goes first, chicken or the egg, plastic or the gasket stuff? And when you look at this, you can see that line on the old one. You can basically read the old parts. See that line that is in contact with this? See where it got dinged in there? So you know that the gasket goes against the outside. And that's usually the way it is. Usually the gasket is on the outside. Then we'll take this guy. It's got that little tab so you can kind of see orientation. But you have these little nubs, nubs and tabs. Am I using the right terminology? Just make sure there's no junk in it to get from the get-go. What's the Hippocratic Oath or something? Do no harm or the the law or whatever you do when you're a doctor. That's my brother, he's a doctor. So you don't want to add any contaminants or anything, make sure it's good and clean. Uh, you pull the throttle back on this side and you'll see why in a minute. When you put this sucker on there, get your tabs to sink in. Come on tabs. They're feeling underappreciated. There's not even a tab soda anymore. Tabs don't get any appreciation. Oh, I'm pulling it too far, that's why. I had, I had this pulled back so far that it was blocking. Alright, so everything's in there and looking good. So then you just take the screw and put this on. Honestly, how hard was that? It's not, is it? Uh, what some people do, you use some Loctite on it. You don't want to strip the threads because this is made out of aluminum or pot metal or just something soft. It just snug it down. Test your throttle action looks good. So here comes the hard part. All right, so here's the best way to do this. There's a lot of ways you can monkey around, waste a bunch of time, but my favorite way to put this on is with a T-pin. Uh, you take your T-pin, put it through this first, put it through, and you can use a sewing needle. It doesn't matter what you use, just something to keep this uh, spring managed. So you load it all up like this. I know it looks ridiculous, but it's not too bad. So I've got a T-pin that goes through the hole in the fulcrum. I just put the pin right in the middle of where that spring's gonna go. See? And then just kind of stuff it down in there. And that way I don't have to see or be able to really feel what I'm doing. And that spring's just gonna go home. Unfortunately, however, I lost my thing. See how handy a pin or a needle is here? So anyway, this is the this is by far the hardest part aside from getting these little uh, plates on and off, which people just don't do. So we'll just get that to that point and then put your screw in. I know you can't see, I'm sorry. Not too sorry. But a little bit. Anyway, just snug that down. So now for the easy part. So we've got our two gaskets, our plate, and our four itty bitty teeny tiny little hummingbird screws. So when you look at this diaphragm, this diaphragm's just badly worn out too. See how it's all just worn out from old gas and time. So this new one's going to make a big difference, I think. So that little pointy bit on the fresh new one that's not all cracky and gross goes toward this little guy in the middle. It actually pushes on it. So put that gasket on. This one can go either way because it is symmetrical. It's got a line of symmetry down the middle. And remember, wherever your gas comes in, you want this little vent or hole to be down because it has to be able to uh, suck and blow basically as that thing moves but you want water to drain out of it or water to get in it. I'll take our little screw put this back in. 
So what I'll do is I'll do the corners first. So that way things stay in place a little better. Gasket in your diaphragm. Don't tighten it down all the way. So then these won't move around where they need to in order to settle in. If I ever hear the word settle, I always think of my uncle Greg. My cousins, they're a little bit rowdy when they get all excited and worked up. You know, I had a bunch of boys say, settle, settle, or settle down. You know, let's talk about settling. It's funny is he is so chill. He's like the chillest uncle. But the boys, they just seem to have a real temper. <laughs> That's my side of the family. All right, here we go. So see, I'm just going on opposite sides, just snugging this down so it doesn't vibrate apart. Two-stroke motors are notorious for that. But there you go, good as new. Uh, the kit for this, I want to say it was in stock and about $9. So it didn't cost much. You can order a whole new one for about 30 or 40 bucks, sometimes 50 or 60. But it's just so easy. I mean, it's just like there's two halves and you just saw how easy that was. If you're wondering what's in there or what goes where or you're nervous about getting into the carburetor, oftentimes you can get an exploded diagram. And that's kind of fun. One of the interesting things about this particular carburetor is that it doesn't have the adjustment that most of them have. You usually have a high and a low screw. And that, adjusts, that adjusts the air fuel mixture when you're wide open throttle and also when you're at low throttle or idle. So this one doesn't have it. It's kind of a cheap carburetor. This is the gasket that goes between the carburetor and the machine and it's pretty much a mess. I've had this off a couple of times to clean it and uh, it's basically for schitzeld. So we're just going to use carburetor maker on this one. Alright then, don't know how the heck this is going to work out but we're going to give it a try. So I take a little bit of brake cleaner. It's really important not to have a vacuum leak between the carburetor and the machine. The intake, whatever it is. So this gasket's important and then also the gasket between this and the engine also important. So I use brake cleaner, I clean all the surfaces, make them so that there is nothing that's going to be like grease oil or whatever to make it let go. So this is more accurate than this. This is kind of vague where to put it. So I'll take the gasket maker and just do a teeny tiny bit. This is way too much. I have to knock that down with the rag. So you do not want that getting in the you don't want that getting into the stream of air between the carburetor and the unit. So I just go around like this, just knock it down flat, and then also pull it to the outside. If it's going to stick out or hang out, I'd rather it hang to the outside. There you go. Get rid of the excess evidence or whatever you want to call it. Best you can. Use hand cleaner for the rest. introduce the choke to the theater of operations and take these guys and put them on first who's on first and then you got to get your little throttle cable in there just sneak that in at the last second you made it just in time just like half the women in my life <laughs> gonna be late ah make a time barely make it done Set this one to the middle because the cover needs to clear it later and then uh, just send these home. I've got the clutch on my drill. Yes, drills have clutches set so that it's pretty soft. You see this washer? That washer is to help hold this in place so that you don't tighten it up all the way but it still kind of holds. Uh, be thinking vacuum leak. You hear that? That's the clutch. So on your drill, that little dial on the end, I'm sure most of you guys know this, but you see how it's not turning? So if you get down to a certain tension or torque, it barks at you and says, hey, stop it, knock it off. So there we go. So 
That's our choke. You see the little bypass. So that's when it totally blocked off. It controls it down to just that little bit. As for the cover that we were talking about a second ago, if you're in the number two position, there's a big hole to let that get through. I'll put that back on the trimmer. Let's stick these back in here. Sinking in the shower, I'm going to kind of go off on a tangent about stubbornness. Everybody says, ah, oh, you're stubborn, or so, like it's a bad thing. Stubborn is what you call a person that falls down in a race and gets back up and has inspirational things written about them, you know, down the road. I think it's okay to be stubborn. I think everything, you know, God makes us with all these different traits and stuff, or the universe creates us with all these traits. I don't care what you believe, but whatever the case is, Oftentimes people that have undesirable traits, whether it's uh, some diagnosis or psycho or whatever, seems like everybody that ever got anything done had that. Whether that's attention deficit or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder or whatever, or being stubborn. Stubborn people finish things. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say. So maybe your diagnosis isn't a diagnosis or a disorder at all. Maybe it's a gift, but just a matter of channeling it and using it properly. All right, so we've got this done. I'm going to throw some fuel in it, and then we're going to fire it up and see how it runs. Uh, previously, it would run for just five seconds and die. So I bet it'll do better now. I don't know if you noticed, but on the back it says 40 to 1. That means 40 parts gasoline to one part oil. This is two strokes, so you use two stroke oil. Like the cap says, fuel and oil mix. And that's because it doesn't have oil that you put anywhere else in the crankshaft. The way that this works is that the fuel goes into here, the air fuel mixture, where the crankshaft is, lubricates all the crank stuff, and then there'll be a bypass where it gets to the cylinder. So I don't know exactly where the bypass is on this one, but then it goes in the cylinder, goes bang, and then goes out through the exhaust. Trouble is, I don't have any 40 to 1 mixed up for this. I've got a ton of this um, 32 to 1 mixed up for my paramotor. So I'm just going to use that. If you have too much oil, it fouls the spark plug, and it can come up your exhaust. But 32, 40, that's close enough. Better to have too much protection or too much oil than not enough. I'd rather clean something than have to replace the whole cylinder. So the way you start this is one, two, three. Um, first you do full choked. So you're going to use a primer bulb. Make sure we got plenty of fuel. If you do too much it cycles back around like you saw. So you get it to sputter. This thing runs like a horse, runs like a deer or whatever, you know. So, it's supposed to sputter, but I did so much fuel that it's just happy to go nuts. But anyway, thing fires up. Man, what a difference. It runs like a champ now. It used to be you'd fight it, fight it, fight it, get it to catch, and run five seconds as you're desperately adjusting and trying to do stuff and then it die. So awesome. And then of course that third session set that third what do you call that? That third setting. Setting's the word. Uh, number three is after it's all warmed up and good to go. You put it on three and it's like being on the highway or running, but it's gotta be warmed up for it to run on that. Anyway, that's the idea. That's how you rebuild the carburetor on these little things. Not too it's not too hard, but there's a few things to know. Thanks for watching. Be sure to click like and subscribe. Bonus footage at the end. So I went to the post office today and was pleasantly surprised uh, by a big old package from Sharon M. Jacobs. She's actually from Missoula, Montana. How fun is it to say Missoula? Try it a few times, I bet you'll like it. So we're going to pop that one open first. I actually got a lot of love at the post office today. So it's John Jacobs. So it says, Brian, 
Hi there from Big Sky Country. I'm jealous I want to be in Montana right now. Just wanted to say thank you for all the outstanding videos. I always learn something new. Please find a sample of Montana license plates and clothes for your project. Keep up the good work on the videos and your mechanics career. You do an excellent job for your clients. Thank you. If you have some time, check out what we do up in Missoula for fun on my channel. Uh, J3 Red 67 YouTube channel. Willie Sedan Delivery Project. I'll have to check that out. And El Camino Project. All projects are on complete budgets and done mostly used in eBay parts. Thanks again for all your... I want to see that. Thanks for all your hard work and have a great week. Thanks, John. I appreciate that a lot. That's awesome. <laughs> Dude, this is an awesome collection. Thank you. 76 Bicentennial from 2000. Ooh, I love this one. John, you're spoiling me, dude. <laughs> dude, this is awesome. I want to do a thing of just these ones. This is an awesome collection. John, you're awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, Greg Delaney. And it is Anadarko, Oklahoma. Yeah, I think I said that right. Brian, here's one from Oklahoma I collected all 50 years ago and have them hanging in order in my shop. That's a, See, he knows what I'm doing here. And I reach a new plate and I move it from the lower level up to the upper level. Still have a few to go. How many, what plates do you need? Because if I have, if you need like a, an Idaho or a California or something, I'd love to send it to you. So I have a few to go. Good luck on your collection, Greg Delaney. Thanks, Greg. Dude, this thing's beefy too. This is like, uh, what was the other state? Illinois are really heavy. This is really heavy. I'd say this is 150 grams. I don't know why I'm obsessed with the weight and stuff, but I'm getting the scale out, just so you know. Yeah, 200. It's like Illinois. It's really heavy duty. That's a good looking plate with that turquoise and stuff. Thanks, Greg. Uh, you're going to have to help me out. Tyler Sheneff, and he's from Madison, Ohio. Hi, Brian. I wanted to send you a few plates I had. These were off my dad's Fiat before he got his personalized plates. I enjoy your videos and saw your list the other day and noticed Ohio was missing and said, yeah, I can help with that. Thank you. They're pretty much new, so they don't have much personality. Haha, <laughs> that's fine. I have a collection of old plates that I made sort of a wall out of, but it took me quite a while to complete and it doesn't help that you can't take plates from junkyards here, so good luck. Thanks for your videos and pointers. I currently own a 1985 S10 Blazer 4x4, that's a classic, and a 2013 Regal Turbo. I didn't know they made a Buick Regal with the Turbo. Well, yeah, I bet it's pretty new. Not sure if you're keeping track of this, but some of the others have sent their vehicles have sent their vehicle models over too. Would be interesting to see what your subscribers drive though. YouTube and pretty much everything else username tie to the lure 92. Awesome, I saw you in the comments you're saying that you sent one out from Ohio. Thanks Tyler. So I've been flying doing some uh, searching for airplane parts. I don't know if I've ever mentioned this on the channel before uh, but there's an airplane that broke up and I've been finding all the parts for it. And so, found another one. I thought I was all done. I found the engine, I found uh, the tail cone, found a whole bunch of these other things, and I thought I was all the way done. I found all the cargo compartment, got it all shipped back to Tucson, and uh, I thought I was all done. I thought I had the whole plane, and I found an elevator the other day, you know, like off of the tail. So anyway, it's sitting here waiting to get picked up. Look how beautiful that is. Thanks, Tyler. <laughs> Word's getting out. I got a couple of plates here. Uh, this one, I'm going to guess, is from New York. Uh, didn't say who it's from. Uh, the other one is uh, from Vincent in Northport, Alabama. I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb and say it's from Alabama. Heart of Dixie. God bless America. That's pretty cool. Thanks, Vincent. Ho, ho, ho. Been there, done that. This is from Mike, so thanks, Mike. This, <laughs> so I got character or what? That's pretty fun. Brand new's awesome. Beat up's awesome. They all have character in their own little way, so that's all. I just appreciate you guys sending those. Look how perfect that is. That is so perfect. It's even been mounted too. Imagine how clean and garage a car must have been. 
Woohoo! Looks like another plate. This one is from Glenn from Egan, Min Minnesota. MN's Minnesota. This package seems to be the way to go. And that's about the cheapest postage. And it fits in the PL box. Perfect. These folded over ones. Unknown bogey. Cheers. Let's see, Brian, thank you for all the great. It's got a deer on it. That's cool. Thank you for all the great info that you give to us on YouTube land. I know I give back. I now give back to you in the form of a couple of old license plates from my 2001 F-150 Enjoy from Glenn. Thanks, Glenn. What a fun surprise. So often I go to the P.O. box and there's nothing. This whole license plate thing's been like the funnest thing in the world for me. I don't even understand what makes me happy sometimes, but this makes me happy. So thank you. It's funny because, you, you know, with the internet, you, you put stuff out all the time and... You know, sometimes stuff comes back in the form of comments or whatever, but I really like this. I don't know why, but I do. It's a lot of fun. It's kind of like something physical, tangible from everybody out there, and it's a fun thing to do. Minnesota, critical habitat. That's cool. Not interesting. Do you guys see what I'm seeing? It's the same plate, but it's got stickers on the front and the back. I didn't know they did that in Minnesota. I'm learning all kinds of cool things as this process. So, all right, let's go to the map and go to the board and uh, get her updated. Now, I like to think I know where Minnesota is, but it takes me a minute. I find it because of North and South Dakota. So we're gonna put a check mark here and we're gonna write Glenn. Gaylord. Whenever I think of like somebody that's like really rich and powerful, I think of the name Gaylord or uh, was it Covington or something that they always did on Awesome Powers? Anyway, awesome. Thanks, Glenn. I went from having 13 plates, uh, meaning Virginia, North Carolina, uh, California. Anyway, you see the ones I had. And look at the hookup that you guys have given me. Look at all these different states and multiple of each state um, on a lot of them. So I just really appreciate all the help that you guys have done. I've got 12 plates come in so far. Uh, since I've been doing this to complete my state collection, plus I got one from Canada. How, is all, <laughs> how awesome is that? That's way cool. And what's the coolest, we are halfway there. I have 25 states present or represented in my license plate collection. I've only got 25 more to go. Uh, so thanks to everybody for all of your pitching in all the different plates. Uh, currently, the only missing ones that we have is Florida, Oregon, Wyoming, Washington, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Maine, Delaware, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Connecticut, Vermont, North and South Dakota, Nebraska, Arkansas, Maryland, Tennessee, Mississippi, New Mexico, Louisiana, Iowa, Kansas, and Michigan. I mean, out of 50 states, there are 50 states in the United States, and I've got half of them now, thanks to you guys. This is awesome. I can't tell you how fun it is. Confession time, I shaved a little bit. Uh, I can't tell you guys how fun it is to go to the post office and have something be there that's not bills. It's stinking awesome. I love it. Uh, the post office is about seven miles each way. And so it's a fun drive. It's really pretty. I love doing it. But when you get there after the seven miles, you get there and you're just like, oh. <laughs> but it's... <laughs> I, I love that there's mail there, and I love your letters that I get from you guys and uh, adding to the collection of plates. Uh, I've got a bunch of different ideas of what to do. I haven't decided on an idea for sure. This is tough to beat. Had this not already been done, I would totally be doing that. Like, how cool is that? Um, this is also really cool. Anyway, there's so many cool things to do. I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do, but I know I'm going to do something cool. Hopefully when I get the new shop built, I'll have a lot of wall space for this kind of thing. So any way you look at it, you know, if you dream it, you can achieve it. You know, until one is committed, there's hesitancy, uh, the tendency to withdraw. But when once is committed, heaven and earth combine and make it happen. So I'm seeing that happen. I just want to say thanks to you guys. You guys are awesome. Love you. Everybody gets.